Um, I threw javelin and shot put for the track team and was on cross country. And I would drive every weekend pretty much when I wasn't in sports to Nashville um, to, to be a studio musician. And I grew up playing bluegrass and singing in church. And when I, I started touring when I was about 13 years old as a, as a touring musician through bluegrass. And I was playing some southern rock and different things. And I met a guy named Red Marlowe um, through some guys in Nashville I, I knew. And Red asked me to play in his band. And he eventually, when I graduated college, asked me to move to Nashville. So I packed up an old camper I had and <laughs> I moved to Nashville and lived there for four years, just struggling to just put food on my table. And, and, and sometimes, I'd, I mean, honestly, there was sometimes I'd sleep in my truck or uh, I, after I got out of the campground when I just didn't have no money because I wasn't able to play music anymore out. And I signed my first publishing deal and the journey kind of took off from there as, as an artist and my songwriting career. And I just kind of always tried to follow my heart and be the person my mom and dad raised me to be. And I just, I've always wanted to, you know, be kind of a lot for where I grew up because I always knew people that, that didn't have a whole lot. And I just kind of wanted to do chase my dreams to show people back at home that, you know, Dreams are worth chasing, and if you work hard enough, you can you can catch them. You know. One of my friends, Barrett Baber, he was on a couple seasons back. He actually came to my show one night and told me he was like, "Man, you need to you need to think about the voice." <laughs> and at the time, I was really hoping hard. Uh, you know, I was praying about a way that I could grow my following. And so I, I got in touch with some people on the show and uh, auditioned, and it led me to the blind audition, and that's kind of how it happened. Man, he, he's a, bro a brother of mine. Um, and when he was actually out on the show, we had several friends that's been on the show and, and done well. And me and him were texting just the whole time back and forth. So I knew what a great experience it was for him to be out there. And when I, I remember the day I called him, I was like, man, I, I got a chance to go out to L.A. to audition for the TV show, The Voice. And he said, stop right there. Kevin Garner, if you don't do this, we ain't friends no more. <laughs> so I was like, all right, there you go. And I, 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 was, I was ready to do it. And then talking to the show, I asked him, I was like, look, you know, this guy has been a huge influence of mine, not only as a, a person because he's a good man, but as a singer, because he, like, you know, in the early years, I, I didn't know a lot of people in this town, and I knew how hard it was as a songwriter, and he was introducing me to the biggest writers that I could possibly get in the room with. And on top of that, Red, uh, a lot of people don't know it, but he was here for 13 years as a demo singer and was one of the biggest demo singers in Nashville. I, almost half of the songs I was listening to in the 2000s, Red was on, it was on radio, he was the one actually singing the songs in the studio for the songwriters for them to pitch to the artists. So I, I, he was teaching me constantly, like, how to perfect my voice and how to get in the studio and, you know, listening to the, to the artists that I was going to do backgrounds for because I was singing backgrounds for him. So he was just a huge part of my whole journey. Um, I would reach out to him and just be like, man, I just need some advice on, you know, like how to navigate through this world of the show and he's always been there for me and he, he was a huge influence on me doing this uh, he really kind of put my heart at ease to know that this was the right step for my life you know it's, it's crazy because I, so i grew up singing a lot of different music um i i love brian mcknight and like otis redden and sam cook and I sang, I just sang like a lot of boys to men and like a lot of oldies music growing up. So I had a huge kind of soul R&B influence. And when Jennifer turned at the same time Blake did, <laughs> I remember singing and I remember the moment going, Oh crap. <laughs> like I might have just pick Jennifer right now. But I, I mean, you know, being here in Nashville, I, I, I've never met Blake, but he's always been a kind of a inspiration to me musically because he's got the career that I have been striving for and 
and sacrificed everything in my life for to get. And so it was kind of like, all right, God, you know what? Like, I'm not going to take a chance at this. I'm going to go to Blake Shelton because he's going to be the one that can teach me something. And I just pulled my heart to him. So I, I had to go with Blake. I mean, at the end of the day, I couldn't look at Red in the next room and go, well, Red's over there. And if I choose Jennifer, he's going to be like, you big dummy. <laughs> so I just, I just went with my heart and, and chose Blake. I, I remember, like, I was never really accepted growing up vocally. As a, as a lead singer because I was playing bluegrass music and I wanted to sing soul music. <laughs> so I kind of, over the years, just I always had like a very unique um, uh, individuality to my voice and I just kind of kept going with that and I guess that's how I became who I am as an artist. I can't read it quick enough to play. That's my problem. I get called up and it's just like, it's just overload from my brain. So my dad always learned how to play by ear. So that's what I started doing. I can just, I can hear a melody and I can pick up an instrument and I can play it now. Um, and so as a producer, because I, uh, I have a couple projects I've put out here in town. and I've had some label interest over the years um, that pushed me to go to the boys so I can grow my following. But as a producer, I just started learning, and like looking up to my heroes that were producers and, and learning how to just, you know, hear it and, and kind of wrote, like go that direction with it as far as playing. And I'm very, um, uh, I utilize the national number system. So, and, and the national number system is something that happened in a studio is where there's a number associated with every chord. And instead of, and if you need to transpose the song to a different key, the numbers still apply to uh, whatever key you're in. So I, I use that a lot. I think it's the normal for musicians to just play by ear because to me, you know, at the end of the day, like I, I've done it all. Like I really, I've, I've, mm -hmm. I've learned to write, I've learned to read music and try to do things the correct way because I want to become the best artist, musician, songwriter I can possibly be. But at the end of the day, what I've learned and what I'm really trying to, you know, practice in my day-to-day -day writing. I woke up this morning, I had a songwriting session, and I remember having the thought, hey, and keep it simple. At the end of the day, like, I'm, you know, everything that I write is for my artist career, pretty much. And when I write something, I always try to tell myself, the person that I'm singing to is my own. And that's, as, a, as an artist, that's who you want to connect with. And they don't always want the most complicated, thought-out, musical thing in the world. They just want something that makes them tap their feet and feel good, and you all, like, I had an old fella tell me one time, you know, though you want to do one thing for you, and that's to make somebody cry. And whether they cry tears of joy or tears of sadness, it doesn't matter. But if you can do that, you have, you've captivated an audience, and you've, like, connected with somebody through a musical sense. So uh, that's kind of what I try to do is just play whatever I feel. Because if I feel it, then it's right. Yeah, I mean, and that's about the only way to do it, I feel like. <laughs> 